<laughs> and uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. So, thank you very much, sir. Let's give him a warm welcome. Yeah. Howdy, folks. Uh, my name is Joshua Ginsberg. A lot of people know me as Jag. Um, I'm the uh, principal Python architect at Celerity. Uh, it's a Business Acceleration Consultancy based out of Tyson's. Uh, we get to do a lot of cool projects with a lot of the really biggest uh, shops in town. Uh, the ones that do Python, my group uh, gets to play with. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a project we did for uh, a client to take a platform service of theirs and turn it into something which was performant, fault tolerant, reliable, scalable, all those things. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are a little bit, a little basic. Uh, some of them are things that maybe we've heard about. We think we know what they're about, but we don't really know what they're about. Some of it's kind of advanced, so uh, I hope there's something in here for everybody. Uh, so let's uh, start by talking about the client. Let's talk about the client. Uh, the client is a half billion a year nonprofit. Uh, their web properties get about 25 million visitors per month. Uh, Across their enterprise, they have multiple independently operated web properties, so different groups within the organization run their own web, but they all agree on a certain set of platform standards. Uh, they'd already implemented single sign-on, so that was definitely a, a big plus for us. Uh, but the goal for their web properties is that uh, membership in uh, having a user account on their system, they found drives donations. They need donations, and since uh, engagement broke membership, they really need to find ways to get people more engaged with what it was they were offering on the web. So the challenge that they gave us was to build an enterprise-wide notification service. Think exactly the same thing as the, the Facebook notification service, to deliver email and insight notices of content interaction events with the goal of increasing cross-property user traffic, the length of the average user session, and to increase visit frequency. All told, the goal of this is to increase membership locations. How many properties are we talking about, roughly? Um, roughly... 20 properties. Okay. Um, so the requirements that we were given were to show all unread messages and all messages read in the last seven days, to retain all message history in a durable fashion, that once a message was seen, to mark it as read, and to make all of the querying and interfacing with this service uh, available through paginated APIs that serve JSON. We were successful, but successfully accepted notifications from every property that wanted to submit one. Uh, we spooled notifications to prevent flurries, so if you went to uh, their photo sharing property and posted a photo and over the next hour 3,000 people liked your photo, you did not get 3,000 emails. Um, and we provided an inbox uh, and an unread message count jewel through a global nav widget that could go in their global navigation bar so it could roll out to any one of their properties as soon as they were ready to have it. Response times were too slow. We were getting about 150 millisecond average service time for inbox API calls, which may not sound like a lot, but for something which you're hitting on every single page and something you need to be super responsive, 150 milliseconds is a lifetime. At the same time, it was only deployed to one of the web properties that they had, and they needed it to scale to every web property. So especially at those performance levels, this was not going to cut. So we needed to make it better. The architecture they had was Nothing too weird. Uh, they used Akamai as a CDN, uh, heading to a, a group of F5 uh, load balancers. Uh, they had an internal squid uh, proxy uh, to make sure that they were uh, uh, reinforcing Akamai with that cache content. Uh, talking to Django, running on Apache with ModWhisky. Uh, Django was talking to PostgreSQL and using Celery with a RabbitMQ broker. Like I said, nothing too terribly crazy. So in trying to figure out what we needed to do, the first stop was New Relic. New Relic is amazing. And you're using New Relic, right? I know, New Relic costs money, but if your site performs badly, you're gonna lose it. So pay money to New Relic. <laughs> Once we looked into New Relic, we found that our database was an unhappy camper. CPU was completely out of control, and most of it, oddly, was I.O. weight. So I.O. weight is when uh, CPU cycles are being completely wasted waiting for information to come back over a network socket or off a disk. Uh, 
Load average, this may not look like a terrible graph until you look at this scale here. Load average is the number of processes waiting for the CPU. We had spikes of over 300 processes waiting for CPU time. Generally speaking, a good rule of thumb is your load average should never exceed the number of cores you have on your box. <laughs> it shouldn't be much higher than four. So 300, a little absurd. And our disks were thrashing. So if they were using a network attached storage device, but we were peeking out fiber channel, reading off this disk. This would not scale in any sort of way. And this wasn't exactly a snappy service. I mean, we're not talking tough things here. This is show me my inbox, mark this as red, and how many unread messages do I have? And those are our average service times. This is bad. So why was the database thrashing? Want to find out? You gotta go to the query. So SQL is a declarative language, which basically means you tell it what you want, and it figures out the best way to do it. So the SQL engine gives us a planner, an interface to say, well, if I were to run this query, how would you handle it? And you invoke the query planner by prefixing any one of your queries with just the word explain. And when in that output, it's fairly complicated, but the things that you're looking for mainly are that sequence scans are bad and index scans are good. So what does the SQL in our queries look like? Well, so here's the, the super simplified basic structure. So we had, uh, this is using uh, a modified free order free traversal FPTT for uh, a tree of applications. Uh, users per application would get notifications. So if you were on one particular app and you only want to see the notifications for that app, you could do so. If you want to see it site-wide, you could do so. But this was the relationship that we were using. Each message was uniquely identified with the digest. So when we did just a fairly standard query. This is how you get the SQL out of query set in Django. You build your query set, so client app user notification options filtered, user user ID, user ID, read is null true, blah, blah, blah. Print QS query. And what Django will give you back is the SQL that it is going to send to your engine. The SQL that comes out of it follows your query set pretty closely. So what it is that we're selecting is the first table that we're looking at. Any joins that we make to other tables is going to result in a join in our SQL. Finally, our constraints on our filter is going to show up in our where clause, uh, mirroring what we've got for So, you said sequence scans are bad, index scans are good, but we should probably talk a little bit about indexes first. So, we all know indexes make things faster. I don't know that we really know why. So, let's talk a little bit about why. So, let's step away from our example and talk about something everybody loves, beer. So, let's say I have this fairly simple model, a uh, number of fields, different types. We're going to work with this guy real fast. So in this model, what should we index? So under the hood, indexes are basically binary trees. Never had a formalized computer, uh, computer science course, you may not know what that is. So we have a list of items and we want to find out, is the item in the list? We're going to have to do as many operations as there are items in the list to figure this out. Computer science speak, we call this a complexity of big O of N. Basically, the complexity of this operation varies directly with the number of elements in the list. If we were to take this list and restructure it as a tree, where anything to the left was less than, and anything to the right was greater than, suddenly, it only takes as many operations as there are levels to our tree. So, in doing the fancy math for it, the complexity is O log base 2 of N. So how does that really compare? I mean, in, in our example, we had seven elements versus three, you know, who really cares? But once you get a thousand rows, you're talking a thousand operations versus 10. A million rows, you're talking a million operations versus 20. 100 million rows, 100 versus 27. The gains grow exponentially. So what's important to remember is that cardinality matters because these indexes are only taking a look at the unique values that you have in your table. So an index B tree is only each, it only has one node for each unique value in your data set. So the more unique values you have in a particular column, the more the efficiency gains you're going to get off of that index. So we could theoretically index everything, but every index itself is a trade-off. Every query can only use one index per join table. I'm going to stop and I'm going to say that again. 
you could have an index on every column in your table. Every query you make is only going to use one of those for every time that you join that table. Every other single index you build will be wasted. And this is bad because every index has a write cost. Every time you write to the database, you have to update your indexes. And every time everything is writing to your database, everything is fighting for the ability to write to your database. But more than that, you do not want your query planner selecting a suboptimal index for your query, which it might. It's a declarative language. It's trying to figure out what it is that you want it to do. So if you intentionally build the indexes that are going to intentionally improve the questions you're asking in your database, you will get the most out of your B-tree indexes. So going back to our model, what should we index? Well, we just learned low cardinality fields are right out. Numerations have low cardinality. So if we have 10, 20 values in there, we're not going to get a whole lot out of an in a B tree with only 20 nodes in it. Boolean fields are now the of two. You should never, ever, ever index a Boolean field. <laughs> Positive integer field with a max value of 10. There's only 10 possible values. You're really not going to get anything out of indexing that. Everything else, however, might be a fairly reasonable choice. Oh, sorry. Foreign keys are always <laughs> indexed by default. Um, so if you actually look at the structure of a table, regardless of the fact that you didn't say you want this index, it builds an index, mostly because of the joining across tables. But everything else is a fairly reasonable possibility. There are a lot of different values here. But really we need to know what questions do we want to ask our database. Knowing the queries you're going to make should guide what field or fields get indexed. And you can experiment in your dev instance. You can go and build indexes and Ask the query planner how that changed things. And you can destroy indexes and see how did that change things with the query planner. Do that in your dev instance. It's a great idea. Also, every database includes tables, well, the queryable interface for how the database has been performing. So the PG stat user tables will tell you how many sequence scans have been done against this table, how many index scans have been done against this table, how many rows have been queried, how many rows were determined by a sequence scan or an index scan. It will tell you how well all of the queries that you're doing on your database are actually leveraging what it is that you put in. Uh, additionally, the PG stat user indexes will tell you how effective your indexes have been. So those are well documented. Uh, MySQL has a similar set of tables, but you shouldn't use MySQL. Um, right, we're doing case study notifications. Yes, notifications. Okay. All right. So this was the query that we were talking about before, and the SQL that came out of it. So when we stuff that in our query planner, this mess is what comes out. That's kind of hard to read, but the important thing that I'm looking for here is that every single one of our joins is using an index. That's good. That means somewhere along the line we did the right thing, which actually isn't that big a deal because all we did was lean on the automatic indexes that Django made for us. But we are using indexes, so that's good. But that might just be a little too complicated. Now, you've probably heard that joins are evil. Uh, that's Cal. Cal Henderson uh, gave the, the, a keynote at DjangoCon 2008 called Why Django Sucks. Uh, and he's not a dumb guy. He has a, a fair number of accomplishments under his belt. Uh, he hates everything, but he hates us slightly less than he hates most things. Um, Cal said in his talk, you don't use joins when you get to a certain scale. So when we're talking, the opposite of doing joins is deep ones. So joins mean cross markers. Basically, you take all the rows in table A, all the rows in table B, and find all the permutations in between the two. So big times big equals really big. <laughs> but full normalization is really simple. You have one copy of all your data in one place. Denormalization means duplicating your data across place. Duplication means synchronizing your data, it means concurrency control, it means all the kinds of things that you have to manage. Sometimes, though, it's worth it. So joins are evil. Joins are unnecessary. You're not Cal. You're not running Flickr, Snap, Slack. I'm not running them either. We all need joins. <laughs> <laughs> Fully normalized data models are where to start. They're simple, they're hard to break. You're not going to have weird errors with fully normalized models. You can denormalize surgically to address performance issues, but make sure you actually have performance issues first. So when we look at optimizing this model, we're always querying for notifications with the 
use what they belong to, and the app that's asking. So what we can do fairly simply is denormalize user and app into the notifications table so we don't have to join across to those other tables every time we look up things in the inbox. And this is actually a pretty good trade-off because those values are highly unlikely to change. It's not like the user ID for a user is going to suddenly change, or the app ID for this app is going to be terribly bald. So in terms of managing copies of data, it's probably a pretty good bet that those things are going to stay constant. So keeping those copies and saving those joins seems like a good call. Additionally, we're always querying the inbox along with a timestamp of notification was read. So we want to know messages that were read in the last seven days or unread messages they were read of null. So we should make a multi-column index on app, user, and the read timestamp together. Multi-column indexes, multi-column indexes are awesome. Remember this? Every query can only use one index per join table, but multi-column indexes key off multiple columns values together and in a specific order. But there's a bonus for that. Since it's using multiple columns in a specific order, you also can use that same index for queries against the leftmost subsets of those columns. So in our case, if we're using client item verification and we index together these three fields, we actually get to use that index for queries that match any of these three permutations. It's the leftmost first. That also does work for my school. So that's basically what we did. We normalized users and apps into notifications, and we set up a multi-column index for the three columns we query against most often. So adding in some of the extra stuff about limiting by apps and limiting by date, that's basically our query that we get. But you notice that we're only selecting from the one table. We don't actually have any joins up here. And so when we go back to the query planner, it's actually a lot simpler than the first query that we were looking at. And in terms of the complexity of the two queries, we've actually saved a fair amount of time by not having to join across just those two tables. Also, it helps to know your DB engine. Every DB engine has its own quirks, has its own little operational things. And you should know kind of the oddities about yours. One of the ones that we paid attention to here is PostgreSQL post tables. They force on disk sorting. So when you have results, when you need to sort them, the database engine can do that in memory, or it can do it on disk. Memory is faster, disk is terrible. You should always try to get memory sorted. However, if we're using a post table, we're always going to do on disk sort. So one of the reasons people hated PostgreSQL early on was that it had an 8 kilobyte uh, column size limit. We don't have, we have text fields. We can have arbitrarily large things, right? Actually, PostgreSQL still has an 8K column size limit. This never changed. What PostgreS did is they used magic tables underneath the hood. So what they do is it creates a hidden table for every one of your text fields, and it chunks the data into 8K chunks. Then when you query against that table and include the text field, it joins to your toast table, and it concatenates the output. So if you don't need the values coming out of your text fields, you should exclude them from every query, because otherwise you're definitely going to be sorting on disk when you don't necessarily need them. So we got rid of, excluded the, the, we deferred the field queries in Django for anything which was a text field. So all this helped. We weren't there yet. At this point, it was time to consider a secondary data store to most SQL. So I love SQL. And everybody in this room should be using SQL, but sometimes it makes sense to get a little help. Using a secondary data store is tricky. First thing you need to make sure of is that you have a single source of truth. There should be one and only one place in your entire ecosystem where the real data lives. If you're going to use multiple data stores, find ones that have complementary strengths and use each one for the things that it's strong at and less for the ones that it's weak at. Because you're having two data stores, you need to expect that there's going to be problems keeping that data together, keeping it synced, dealing with race conditions. And so we need to anticipate that. And finally, you need to deal with the disaster mitigation plan. What happens if one of your secondary stores goes away? What happens if two of your secondary stores go away? How are you going to rebuild that data so that your, your application can be functional? 
So for this case, we chose Redis. Redis is an absurdly fast in-memory key object database. Redis is absurdly fast. It's a single-threaded, lightweight, highly optimized server. Uh, tens of thousands of transactions a second. It is entirely in memory. You can, but you really, 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 really shouldn't ever have a data corpus in Redis that is larger than the available amount of memory in the box. Redis does not do well when it has to seek to disk to do queries. And it's a key object database, which is one dimension more complex than something like memcache. Redis matches keys to simple data structures, so lists, sets, dictionaries, integers, strings, things of this nature. So like we said, when we're managing the two data stores, these are the four things that we really need to make sure we do. So let's talk about the first one. Always have a single source of truth. PostgreSQL is durable. SQL is there because it's durable. And battery backed RAID and PostgreSQL is extremely durable. PostgreSQL really, really, really should be your single source of truth between Postgres and Redis. Strengths of the data stores. Redis is great at single record access. Redis is great at counting, whereas PostgreSQL is terrible at counting. Redis is great at structured data, whereas PostgreSQL is limited by the schemas that you get. But SQL is great for arbitrary questions. So we need to make sure that for most of our queries, we're talking to SQL because we can ask it anything and it'll figure out the best way to do it. But Redis, we can ask very specific questions and leverage its strengths and get a faster, better result. Expect concurrency problems. So we need to lock data subtrees. If your data has natural, I don't even want to say sharding, but grouping of data that will always be modified together, you need to make sure that you lock it between your data structures when making those modifications so the two writers aren't writing at the same time. Timestamps make for a poor man's cross server locking system. Um, I don't like using timestamps for locks, but I do it. Um, the biggest reason is clock skew. It's really, really, really easy for microseconds of time, milliseconds of time, seconds of time between servers to completely destroy a locking system and to ruin all of your concurrency control. It's not a super reliable way to synchronize between machines, but if you're going to do it, you've got to have a good NTP server got to have the same NTP server between the two to make sure that they are aggressively syncing their clocks to make sure the clock scheme is kept in between the machines. Finally, know your disaster mitigation plan. I generally go into a situation assuming all data in Redis will be lost. Redis does write to disk, and Redis can write to disk. I rarely have Redis write to disk because I want to make sure that the thing works when Redis loses all of its data. But we really want to focus on making sure Postgres doesn't lose any of its data. But the best case scenario that we're looking for is that Redis can recover online zero downtime as the service runs in order to make sure that we get the most performance with the most reliable. So the, the elements that we look for in our Redis solution is we decided to use Redis keys to represent user inboxes as opposed to individual messages. Um, all writes had to go to both data stores. So uh, if you marked a message read or if a new message got delivered, it got written to both. We use timestamp blocks in Redis to lock at the user inbox level. So an individual user's inbox could be locked against writes from other processes, but other users' inboxes could be locked separately for writes against theirs. And we set up a fallback to post receivable to make sure that we were warming up the Redis cache and recover from Redis failures with zero downtime. Pull the plug on the Redis server, everything fell back to Postgres. Plug the Redis server back in, as users check their inbox, the Redis cache will slowly warm up until it was really populated with all of the active users. One of the tricks about Redis, though, is making sure that you optimize the data structures you select for the questions that you want to ask. Like you said, SQL is super flexible, and Redis is super not flexible, but Redis can be excellent when you ask it the right questions with the right structures. So on one hand, we need to make sure that only read messages that were read within the last seven days stayed in the inbox. Since that's what we're live querying, that's really all Redis should take care of. But it means that Redis needs to be able to drop out messages that are older than seven days as they become seven days. So the obvious solution for us was scored sets. The scored set is a set in Redis where each item in the set has a score associated with it, just a number. 
In our case, we use the, the read time of that message in ebook seconds as, a, as the score. And it meant that we could use the command Z rem range by score, which meant that we could remove anything that had a score less than a certain value just based on those scores in order to prune old messages. The complexity of that operation is O log 2 of n plus m, where n is the number of messages and m is the number of them. So we're really not talking a terribly complex operation, even in a very large box. But we also had all the unread messages per user that we needed. The operation that we were performing against that the most was marking them red. So the mark red operation came in from the API referencing the UUID for that particular message. But once read, what we needed to do was move that over to the red Z set so that it could be sitting there waiting to be pruned seven days later. And for this, hashes were the perfect choice. We used the message digest, the UUID, as a key so that we could easily remove those values as red. And we had locking. So a new message comes in. We have to write it to both Postgres and Redis. The user might very well at the same time be reading their messages. We have to deal with the potential that there are multiple things trying to write at the same time. And those race conditions can be horribly tricky to track down. So we need to do so aggressively. One of the nice advantages of Redis is that it's single threaded and all of its operations are atomic. Redis doesn't do multiple operations at the same time. Every operation it does will complete in its entirety before any other connection can do the next operation. That makes it fantastic for doing timestamp locking because you know that when you start an operation, nothing, will get, nothing else will get to write to Redis before your operation is finished. So we use timestamps to lock entire users' inboxes against concurrent rights. Let me say again, timestamps are weak as locks because clock skew really weird edge cases that you will be unable to reproduce and wreak havoc on your data structure. So if you're going to use timestamps, make sure your NTP server is tuned super aggressively. But if you can avoid it, avoid it. Um, if you're interested, I posted the code that I used for Redis locking uh, up on uh, GitHub. So that's a link to a gist for a context manager for uh, Redis locking. So you can say with our lock of whatever the key is that you're trying to lock against, and in the middle do some Redis operations, and you will be guaranteed your database operations. You will be guaranteed that no other process can talk to that section, can contain that log while you are holding it. Um, it also includes a, a variable stale lock pruning. So if a process died before releasing a lock, you can automatically. Uh, so. Um, we also have to make a call problem. So when you have two data stores, what happens? One of them goes down. What if Redis goes down? Well, all read queries <coughs> should go to Redis first. That's the fastest place to ask those questions. But should fall back to Postgres if Redis isn't there, or if the user's inbox isn't in Redis. All write queries, however, must talk to Postgres SQL in order to be considered successful, regardless of whether Redis was there or not. Redis wasn't there, Redis will start up with a completely cold cache. As it user inboxes are queried back out of Postgres, they will get populated into Redis. So a user whose inbox is not in Redis reads from Postgres, and then Redis, from that point after, becomes the place where the user's queries uh, from the API calls end up going. Which was great for the operations folks at our client. They sat us down and said, okay, what's the run book for this guy? All right, it's three in the morning, pager goes off, Redis is down, what do I do? Back to sleep. It'll keep going. I, I, I would stop the Redis server right there to show them it would keep going. Uh, so they didn't really have to care. So, okay, well, I, all right, I'm in the morning. We need to recover from the Redis failure. What do we do? We start. It'll catch itself up. It'll just slowly start warming up, and they don't have to do anything. Uh, so basically, all they had to do was keep it plugged in, keep the tubes flowing, and the system worked. Um, downstream caching rules. Um, client is paying a lot of money. Akamai is really, really expensive. I don't know if you've ever had to pay an Akamai bill, but oh my god, they are really 
very expensive. <laughs> really should use it if you're going to pay that much money for it. And if you're interested, there's a DC Python meetup next month on caching. Uh, you should go. I, I hear the speaker is pretty good. Um, <laughs> long story short, every response, every web server response includes a header last modified. It includes the timestamp that response last changed. Subsequent requests from a client will include if modified since. The header with that timestamp, the last modified that you received. The web server at that point has a choice. It can look at the if modified since and decide, no, as modified. And all it has to return is 304 not modified. That's it, done. The client will reuse the last response, or in this case, Akamai will reuse the stale response and give it to the client again, which is way faster. So, if we touch a timestamp in Redis with every right to the user's inbox, when a new request comes in, all we really have to do is compare that timestamp to the if modified since header. If it hasn't changed, 304. Don't have to do any queries, don't have to render any JSON, don't have to transfer anything. It's just, no, it doesn't change. That saves us a lot of processing. We didn't really change the architecture much. All we did was stick Redis over there in the corner. That really helped us out. So going back, the changes that we made was that we denormalized our data model very, very surgically. Crafted indexes based on specifically the questions we were asking, the ones that we needed the most performance out of. We made sure that we were only querying text fields when they were needed so that we were getting the most out of our in memory sorting the database. We used Redis to structure cache and user inboxes so we didn't have to go and hit Postgres nearly as much. And we used HTTP caching headers to avoid unnecessary work on our service. How do we do? Well, after our work, literally like a week after our work, the service was rolled out to other web properties uh, and told the number of users and messages that started coming to the system the quad. That was our CPU graph. <laughs> that was our load average on a quad core box. That was our disk I.O. Oh yeah, no, it was actually working harder. It uh, was handling one and a half megabytes. For a nine megabit after. So we reduced the database load average by 100 times. Database CPU dropped 20 times, all while the request service quadrupled. The API service time reduced from 150 milliseconds down to 15. So that was pretty good. Um, <laughs> but uh, happy to field any questions. Uh, also, my Pitch. Um, so I run the Python practice of Solarity, and we get to deal with cool problems like this. We get to come up with interesting, cool solutions for like high-scale problems, and uh, uh, really would like some more people to come work with me because uh, we've got some really cool problems coming down the pipe. I mean, we use really smart people to help us out. With. So I don't care if you're junior, I don't care if you're senior. Uh, we hire people who have no professional experience, and we train them the whole way. Um, we just want people who are motivated to learn. Ask good questions and write code that we want to read. That's basically all we care about. Um, but as far as this project, this resolution, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. So you spent the most time talking about Redis. Was that the largest? Uh, oh, so by far. Um, so Redis being in memory took so much load off the disk. Um, the one of the hardest parts that Postgres was having um, was that, uh, in addition to having to shoulder all the rest of the load in the database, it wasn't able to keep the entire, wasn't able to keep the relevant sections of the notification table in memory. And so it ended up having to keep going back to disk in order to pull new data off the disk. Um, and the, uh, the sorting rule. Um, so, uh, like I said, Postgres is terrible at counting. So getting Redis to do the counting for us was really, really helpful. Um, and only going to Postgres when we were actually writing, or when we first were querying query users in box the first time, made a big difference. Uh, even when we pulled the plug on Redis, and, and we did that just to make sure it worked, uh, we were still getting 35, 40 millisecond response times. Um, but uh, Redis was definitely the thing that, that turned it into uh, a performance level. So the pattern was your, your posts are the same, but your debts are, I looked at, at 
Postgres if it's not there, I read it from Postgres and yeah, it's it's there, and then I push it into the yep. Redis. I mean, with basically, uh, if Redis, then Redis, else DB. Yeah. Actually, all of our methods were called that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was else DB and then push to Redis. Right? So if we ever queried it from the DB, after we return it to the user, we write it to Redis. Okay. So your writes were going to a single API endpoint, but that was static to both the data stores. Uh, so it was a, I mean, single API endpoint, so it was the same API endpoint. Yeah, sure. So like your push request goes in and then it sends, yes. stores the data in both One Postgres server, one Redis server. Um, and uh, the Redis server, even though it was handling all of that load, was uh, over it would be an understatement. Was it um, sequential, like you'd write to one and then the other? Um, or did you? We wrote to Postgres first to, to make sure that the write completed. Um, and if Postgres succeeded, then we wrote to Redis. And when did you acknowledge the request? Like after both of the writes or after, after both of the writes? Uh, so, well, half the writes were coming in from the back end. So, uh, services, <coughs> post notifications that went in, went through a processing chain decide if a message had to be made for it. Uh, the other half of the rights were uh, mark this message read. And so those were some more of the instruments. So did you ever get out of step with the two where you had to like run a background task to kind of clean up and make sure that they were? And if we did, all we'd do is stop right as we started. downstream caching, good things, bad things, things you should know about your caching store, and things you should know about HTTP. I do have one more question. Sure. So you mentioned that like after you implemented all these performance changes, uh, it was only about two weeks later that they ended up rolling out this platform to a whole bunch more users. Was like, <laughs> did that make you nervous? <laughs> uh, I was kind of excited. I mean, okay. uh, you know, the, when we flipped, so we flipped the switch on this for that one service first. We did the release, and you know, the, the product manager was just staring at new relevant CD graphs. Like, and so we stopped everything for the release. Like, okay, start again. Yeah, it's up. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, no dude, this is flat one. Yeah, but it's up. Come on, we can check it. Like, there was nothing. Like, it did not tax the hardware the slightest. Um, so uh, I was kind of excited to see what would happen, uh, and uh, I was interested to see what would happen in, after we get the full rollout. Uh, we did simulate a failure to just see what would happen in the performance line, and it was all still within. So, yeah, that was good. Wow. Um, we, uh, the burn rate on our Redis memory, um, uh, we, after the first day, it was uh, four and a half gigs. Of inboxes when it's stored. And, uh, uh, that server would have sufficed for five or six months. Uh, and that, that increased one of the, uh, especially the earlier versions of Redis, one of the things is that Redis, uh, Redis's key bit doesn't defrag. So if you delete things out of Redis, uh, it will never release the memory that has anything after it in the heap. Um, so Redis's memory for crypto. Redis is using all the memory in the box or database. The data store may not actually be that big, and Redis will fill in the gaps afterwards, but uh, uh, you, you actually do have to keep an eye on the server status to see how much data you really do have versus how much memory the box is using. So I'm fairly new to the concept of Redis. Um, I think you mentioned there was a there's a broker for Redis, or did I mishear that earlier on? Well, so Redis is a server, think? but you mean with Celery? Uh, so, uh, so okay. uh, this client uses RabbitMQ for their Celery broker. Okay. Uh, Redis also can function as a Celery broker. Um, I think 
it's actually a superior accelerator broker because uh, it has a couple of features. The Rapid MD driver doesn't have. Most notably, if you're ever doing uh, cords, like multiple tasks from callback and abandon it, uh, Revs has a much better solution than Rapid MD. Uh, but in general, I would say that unless you can uh, espouse a reason why you want to use Erlang, you don't want to use Erlang. And if you avoid using Erlang, you should. <laughs> But if you're using Redis with Sys, uh, uh, in that case, you can use Sys. I would configure a Redis server differently. So, uh, I intentionally wanted Redis to get a clean slate the minute that it restarted because I didn't want to have to worry about synchronizing data between the two of the writes that happened one that didn't happen the other. But it is possible to use Redis has two write to disk modes. One is uh, an append, so it's uh, basically like a journal. Okay. Um, and the other is a full snapshot mode. Uh, Redis, I guess the single threaded snapshot is the only time it ever forms a separate process in order to write the snapshot out to disk. Uh, I, uh, I mean, I'll show my age. I, I, uh, I got used to never writing this for Redis because I was hosting it with uh, EC2 with EBS backstores, and EBS backstores were just too slow uh, to write out a full Redis dump at the time. Um, so I just kind of got used to it being purely bald. Um, SSDs they have now, it's a little bit of a provision in BIOPS that it's totally normal. Uh, I just don't consider it as durable as open source. Uh, I wouldn't trust it as my durable store uh, ever. Okay, let's give another hand for Jack.